to all those who are watching, welcome. Our session today will be on transitioning to the new rural cannabis economy. And our presenter today is Tracy Harvey. Ms. Tracy Harvey is a rural studies PhD student at the University of Guelph and is an instructor at Selkirk College in the Katoni region of British Columbia. Uh, with interest in the well-being of her uh, local rural region, Tracy can't help but get involved with the timely research project in order to promote a safe and sustainable legal cannabis industry. I am now going to pass it to our presenter, Tracy. And Tracy, I will get you to share your screen as well. And you can start whenever you are ready. Okay, thanks, Munzlein. So thank you so much for joining me today. Hopefully my internet connection persists through this session. I am in rural British Columbia, so there's a chance it could be flaky. I'm thrilled to share with you my project titled Transitioning to the New Rural Cannabis Economy that's really focusing on the impacts of cannabis legalization to rural regions of BC and particularly those that have been historically cannabis producing areas. I'm sure all of the listeners know that in three weeks time under the Cannabis Act Bill C-45, cannabis will be legal to possess, grow, distribute and sell all over Canada. And I did want to mention that I welcome feedback at the end of this presentation. And if we don't get a chance to address your questions or comments today, feel free to follow up with an email or through my project website, which I will share on the last page. So I wanted to mention that this is a PhD project supported by uh, my employer, Selker College, and their Rural Innovation Chair in Rural Economic Development, Community Futures of Central Kootenai. I see a couple of people have tuned in today. Thank you. MITAX, uh, Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, and the School of Environmental Design and Rural Development at the University of Guelph. I also wanted to mention that um, uh, other local supporters include the Craft Cannabis Association of BC and the Kootenai United Cannabis Association as well. So during this webinar, I'll be discussing my PhD research project. I'll provide some background and context to situate the level of importance of this project, why it needs to be done now, and how it's contributing to new knowledge. I'll share the goal and objectives and a brief discussion about my methods. I'll share my current understanding of the phenomenon, including who the key stakeholders are and identified challenges and opportunities at this date. And then I'll talk about um, policy goals um, of Bill C-45 and what I see as potential issues. So over time and space, we've seen significant changes in public perceptions of cannabis and its believed benefits and harms. Previously, it was seen as this evil drug that uh, users could kill without remorse. And now it's being recognized as a medicine in many countries across the world. And if not a medicine, it is being recognized as less harmful than many illicit substances that people currently um, partake in, such as tobacco and alcohol. And I would suggest that the legalization of cannabis at the national level is a very pioneering move since Canada is the second country only behind Uruguay to do this. However, uh, legalizing recreational use is part of a global trend of cannabis liberalization laws um, that have been evolving since de facto legalization in the Netherlands 40 years ago, medical legalization in California in the late 90s, as well as some other US states, uh, decriminalization in Portugal in 2000, and medical legalization in Israel as, and other countries like Canada in 2001. And so today we see over 40 countries with these liberalized um, cannabis laws, which means people, these countries have legalized medical cannabis or decriminalized possession or both. And it's probably fairly obvious that legalizing cannabis at the federal level for a country of 32 million people with a well-established cannabis producing industry will have implications. So let's talk about the BC cannabis industry. Um, th there's a deeply rooted cannabis industry in British Columbia that goes back to the 60s or 70s when hidden microgrows peppered remote temperate landscapes, partially as a result of the draft dodger movement. It's an industry that has grown and shrunk according to market demand, much like a legal commodity in many ways. But over time, a huge cannabis industry has developed um, and clearly exists in Canada, particularly in BC and with a prevalence in rural BC, where small independent microgrows are in abundance. BC is world renowned for its potent and consistent craft BC bud. It's been sought after worldwide for decades and the market has responded to the demand over time. 
But most recently, the market has really developed and evolved uh, because of our liberalization laws around medical legalization in 2001. These regulations have really helped shape the industry that exists today. And medical legalization has allowed for the development of a decentralized legal and semi-legal and even illegal supply chain over our province and country. So over the next few slides, I wanted to show you some data on what we do know about our medical system that I'm suggesting is has supported the development of this industry over the last, say, 20 years. So I'll show you some information about our licensed producers, client registrations, which represents the demand for the product, personal and designated production licenses, and the proliferation of dispensaries across British Columbia. So this slide shows our licensed producers in Canada, and there's not many of them. There's only 118. But these are large corporations um, with deep pockets. They reportedly spent between one to two million dollars just to apply for a federal license through Health Canada. Um, these are the Tilray's, the Canopy Gross, the Aurora's that we hear about in the news. CBC was just saying the other day that these three companies are actually worth more than Canadian Tire right now. Um, so needless to say, these companies have been ramping up for recreational production. And you can see from this chart that Ontario holds the majority of these licensed producers, but followed closely, well, closely in some regards by British Columbia and then Alberta. And really on a per capita rate basis, because Ontario has three and a half times the population of BC, there's actually a higher rate of licensed producers in British Columbia. Um, and, and these large players already have an oligopoly over the cannabis industry, leaving little room for the small independent participants, particularly with how legislation is set up. This slide shows client registrations, and these are clients who are registered with licensed producers. So legally, uh, medical cannabis can only be obtained through licensed producers right now. Um, Stats Canada does know they have reported that only 10% of medical clients actually do obtain their cannabis through licensed producers. So that means the majority of medical clients are obtaining their cannabis in other ways through the gray market or the black market. Uh, and again, you can see that Ontario holds about half of the client registrations. And Alberta has followed uh, closely behind Ontario with client registrations. And what's interesting to me about this slide is it shows that British Columbians are not accessing cannabis through licensed producers. We only have about 8% of the, of the client registrations compared to Ontario. So this means British Columbians for medical purposes are accessing cannabis through other means. And this slide helps us to understand where they're accessing cannabis to some degree um, because it shows us the small, again, Health Canada licensed um, personal use production licenses or designated use production licenses. These are licenses that medical clients who have been prescribed cannabis or authorized to possess cannabis for medical purposes um, can obtain through Health Canada to grow for their own use or they can designate someone else to grow. So there's 15,000 in Canada. BC holds about a quarter of these and Ontario holds about a third of them. And again, on a per capita basis, BC has the highest rate of, of these small licenses. So this is really starting to help us understand how this market, this strong cannabis market has been able to evolve. And in particular, over the last, you know, over the recent years uh, under these licenses. So these licenses have provided a way for local farmers to legitimize their businesses um, and to afford some protection. Um, under under this new licensing. And finally, uh, one slide just to show um, the prevalence of dispensaries, which I understand there's a lot of dispensaries in Ontario as well, but in British Columbia, dispensaries have proliferated. In Vancouver, there's over 100 dispensaries. In Victoria, there's over 100 dispensaries. And then throughout the interior, we have several as well. Um, Nelson is a town of 10,000 people and it has seven dispensaries. So one dispensary can serve about 1,500 people. And dispensaries have really given a way for farmers to get their product to market. They're currently illegal under federal law, um, but they've provided this, they've arguably provided a need to medical patients in providing a face-to-face -face service. And so dispensaries are part of what has helped shape and create this current cannabis industry that we see in BC. So moving to what the cannabis industry looks like in rural BC, originally one of my objectives was to understand and pinpoint 
really to measure the size, extent, and structure of, rural BC, of the rural BC cannabis industry. I've since abandoned that objective for a variety of reasons. One reason is because it's such an elusive industry that really is gray in terms of its boundaries. I mean, people are participating in the black market, the gray market, and the legal regime, and it's really hard to identify what portion of cannabis businesses are within each of those separate areas. Um, and also within my two-year time frame, it's a little bit too short of a time frame to really identify how the participation in the black market changes with legalization or not. But what we do know is that the cannabis industry is substantial to rural regions of British Columbia. People say it contributes anywhere from 10 to 80 percent of local economies. In small areas where I live, um, in the Kootenai region, local people suggest that cannabis directly supports 50% of their economy and then indirectly supports the other 50%. So what they mean by that is these other local businesses that might not be cannabis related benefit from the cannabis profits. So these are the restaurants that, um, you know, people come spend their money in or the high end bike stores or the car dealerships, for example. Um, and according to Stats Canada, BC is the largest producer of cannabis, even though the previous slide showed us that on a medical scale, we aren't the largest producer, Ontario would be. Um, but BC is, or Stats Canada is, you know, estimating production based on other mechanisms, and they're su suggesting that 40% of Canadian production is coming from our province. And what really interests me about this phenomenon locally is this rich cultural history of cannabis production that's been going on for two or three generations where um, people have perfected growing techniques and found efficiencies, reduced their ecological footprint and bred varieties of strains that are very unique and highly sought after. The culture has been so common in some of these rural areas, uh, particularly where I live, that many community leaders have even been involved in the industry, like from elected officials to high school principals and teachers. And so you can really understand how this cannabis culture has formed and the cannabis industry has been a big part of the culture locally. So the legalization is a big deal. Um, and finally, the growth of the cannabis industry originally was initiated as a response to a decline in natural resources. And so this brings me to a question that starts to formulate about the fate of cannabis farmers with legalization, if they can't transition, would they be facing a similar path as the decline of these other industries? And therein lies the challenge that I'd like to address with my project um, that rural BC communities with historical prevalent cannabis production face. What will happen to these existing farmers and their heritage, their skills, their knowledge of the craft cannabis production within the existing legalized regime? If the already established industry can't transition due to market consolidation and economies of scale that the commercialization of cannabis has already been benefiting from, will our rural areas face the same decline as areas that have undergone mining closures or the shutdown of fisheries, for example? So this brings me to my research question that I'd like to share with you. And so what I'd like to answer is how can the Kootenai region, which is the rural region I live in, effectively transition to the new rural cannabis economy? What does it mean to effectively transition? What has to happen and who has to be involved? Um, so this is going to be a case study on the Kootenai region, which I'll show you if you're not familiar with the west um, of, of Canada. The Kootenays are located in the southeastern corner of British Columbia. We are comprised of three regional districts, the Kootenai Boundary, the Central Kootenai, and the East Kootenai. And we have a total population of about 150 people, which is about equivalent to the population of PEI. And the Kootenays do comprise about 3% of BC's population or 6% of our land mass. So my, our project, my project objectives really are rooted um, in new regionalism thinking. So I really, I want to identify the stakeholders and how they're engaging with uh, information for their evidence-based decisions or whether they are or not. I want to know whether all stakeholders are being heard and whether they're being invited to the table for this monumentous <laughs> And I want to uncover how they're responding to this transformative policy change. 
So my objectives really are steeped in this place-based development, with, which is part of new regionalism theory, where we work together collaboratively with this sort of new governance model um, to invite all stakeholders to, to work together um, to, to address this transformation or this transformative time. So just briefly, my project methods, it is a case study on the Kootenai region, although I'm looking at the entire rural British Columbia for context. I'll be using a mixed methods approach, but my primary source of data is through key informant interviews. And then my secondary data that I'm going to consult and use to back up the information I gather will be things like data from my thought exchange survey, which I'll talk about, um, Stats Canada, employment statistics and their labor force survey, um, regional data such as business starts and building permits, the National Cannabis Survey, which is a, um, a survey done over 2018 every quarter to understand demand and usage, and also the Cannabis Stats Hub. So why now? Um, I, I mean, there's this obvious October 17th deadline that's coming up in three weeks. Um, and, and this is, uh, it's sort of an arbitrary deadline in a lot of ways, but it's really this big deal for cannabis farmers to decide if they're going to become legit or not. And despite worldwide cultivation and centuries old um, cultural and social uses of cannabis, um, the inclusion of cannabis as an industry as part of a nation, nation's economy has largely lacked due to either its perceived insignificance, according to StatsCan in 2017, or because of its daunting magnitude worldwide, because cannabis has been grown in almost every country in small batches, both indoors and outdoors, shared freely, traded informally, um, grown by the consumers themselves and by individuals not involved in any other crime. So it's really hard to put your finger on this industry or it has been really difficult. We do know that there's a substantial cannabis industry in our country and StatsCan estimated last year that the cannabis production was larger than beer um, and also larger than tobacco. Stats Canada also reported that nearly 5 million consumers spent about $6 billion on this industry last year, and they're projecting by 2020 in two years that this industry may be worth about $20 billion. That's a big industry. To put that in perspective, that's about two thirds of the agricultural, fisheries, forestry, and hunting industry put together, which is worth $28 billion. So cannabis is going to be a big industry. And so historically craft producing regions like the Kootenai rural region and other rural regions of British Columbia face a big risk because legislation right now doesn't support independent farmers. So my current understanding um, that I'll share with you is is gen has, I've generated it based on a few um, activities. One was this thought exchange that I conducted over the summer. So thought exchange is this online collaborative platform um, that allows people to survey um, participants in a non-traditional manner. It doesn't require participants to select canned responses, but allows them to share their thoughts freely and confidentially that then get rated on by other participants. So I put one question out um, using Thought Exchange as a platform. I said, what are the challenges and opportunities of legalization to rural areas of BC? And over 200 people responded and over 4,000 ratings were made. So using content analysis, I was able to identify some emerging themes and uh, especially those that are you know, perceived as important to people who responded. I've also attended um, information sessions. We've had a lot of activity in our region, which is fantastic. It just shows all these groups wanting to work together. Our regional district, Central Kootenai, hosted six information sessions. Wayne Stetsky and Murray Rankin came out to talk about legalization and what it means um, to answer any questions that citizens had. I've attended some local government conventions, a local one um, in Fernie, the Association Kootenai Boundary, and also the Union of British Columbia Municipalities, where I could talk to elected officials to understand whether this phenomenon was also prevalent according to their opinion and, and, and their knowledge in their areas or just you know prevalent in the Kootenai region. And of course I've been engaging in informal conversations which has helped um, generate my current understanding. So themes that emerged I categorize as opportunities and challenges. And in terms of opportunities, people are really excited about developing a formalized cannabis economy. People are really excited about harnessing our local knowledge that is regarded as one of our greatest strengths. Um, and so again, sort of steeped in this place-based development, um, 
you know, this is something that is a real true opportunity that people hope that we can develop on. Um, people are also excited about the research and development that will come with legalization because under prohibition it's been very restricted. And this isn't just about the harms and benefits of the drug on an individual level, but also, you know, improved cultivation technique, techniques or strain development. Um, and so on. People are also looking forward to the harm reduction that should result with a regulated supply chain so that users know what they're getting. And education is seen as an opportunity with legalization since stigmatization should fade away. It should be less taboo to talk about this substance. And youth are really asking for honest and open education. They've said that they understand that there are risks and harms to the developing brain for people under 25, but they also want to know what the benefits are um, in an honest and open way. So with legalization, we do see some opportunities. But I should know that of the challenges um, brought forward, there were three times more challenges that were shared, particularly through thought exchange and that all of these information sessions, people are really concerned about legalization. And they're primarily concerned for the rural socioeconomic well-being of, of these areas that have had these prevalent um, cannabis producing histories. And so people know that there's barriers to transition. It's not that easy just to, you know, move into the legalized regime. There's a ton of compliance to adhere to. There's costs associated with it. And there's a lot of uncertainty. Um, so, for example, the federal government has said that there's these micro licenses that should allow the transition of these small participants. But the micro licenses haven't even been released yet. People don't even know what's actually included in a micro license. There's rumors of it still costing $100,000 to $200,000 just to apply for that license. And so that's certainly a barrier to transition. People are concerned about policy that's related to economics. Um, one such policy is, is, you know, the provincial government of British Columbia is requiring this um, provincial distribution warehouse system. So these small independent farmers would have to ship their product down to Richmond and the Lower Mainland and then ship it back out to the Kootenays. Um, they can't do farm to gate sales or uh, or farm, farm to table sales or farm gate sales, they can't engage in their with their clients that way. And so it's really putting small farmers um, at a disadvantage. And then there's concern for social policy. If I think of this in a rural context, um, for British Columbia, there's, um, there's consideration for co-location of cannabis and liquor stores in rural areas. And I think that that's a disservice to our communities. Um, while we don't know enough about these two substances, we do know that mixed together, there's multiplicative negative effects, especially if um, someone engages in driving under the influence. So that's a potential problem. And people from the medical community are really concerned about access to the products with legalization because right now with dispensaries, there's all these products available for medical patients like edibles and tinctures and other formulas with legalization it's going to be very restrictive as to what's available and so medical patients are really concerned about their health and access to these products with legalization and then our youth are an area of concern with social policy many people in our area are really concerned about the increased penalizations to youth and the increased number of penalties and so youth are already overrepresented in possession charges as are minorities. And looking to studies south of the border, they're actually suggesting that these minorities are continuing to be overrepresented with legalization. And so youth are potentially facing a lifetime of marginalization if they're convicted of a crime. I mean, that's really interesting for an area like ours where youth have been brought up in this culture of cannabis and maybe it's not perceived in the same way. So I've identified stakeholders, and this is not an exclusive list. I'd love to hear your feedback on it. Let me know if I've missed someone or if you don't think someone should be here. Um, I've identified local, provincial, and federal governments as having a stake in legalization. Certainly health practitioners from the social point of view, law enforcement's role is going to change. Our educators have a stake in legalization. Certainly our cannabis industry participants, <clears throat> and we're really listening to them in, in, in our area. Our youth are a large stakeholder group who have been saying that they've been left out of conversations around policy that's developed for them and about them. Um, local businesses, and this is sort of non-cannabis businesses, but they have a stake in legalization as well. Maybe this is too broad of a category, but I mentioned residents in general. And then I wanted to also be sure to include non-supporters of cannabis because there is a big, there is a strong group out there who doesn't support legalization 
legalization, who doesn't support the transition of existing um, participants in the, in the cannabis industry. And, and we need to listen to their concerns and, and work with them as you know, we move forward in the legalized regime. So moving on to the Cannabis Act and its objectives, the Government of Canada has stated four objectives associated with Bill C-45, the Cannabis Act. The first one is to prevent youth from accessing cannabis, uh, because right now, apparently, it's easier to obtain than alcohol. Um, so that's one goal or one objective. The second one is to protect public health and safety with a regulated supply chain. Um, consumers will know what they're getting. Um, dosages should be, in, you know, uh, I guess product will be dosed out or it will be communicated with how dosing should occur. Um, Another objective is to deter criminal activity. So there's greater penalties. There's up to 14 years in jail if people operate outside of the legal regime. There's also more penalties um, with legalization. And so the Act really wants to move um, people into the legalized regime if they're going to participate in this industry. And then finally, they, the Act wants to, or writers of the Act, want to reduce the barriers on the criminal justice system. We've probably um, all heard that 50% of drug convictions are related to simple possession of cannabis, and that's clogging the courts because a lot of them are thrown out. They're perceived as, uh, you know, you know non-detrimental non to society at large. Um, and so hopefully with legalization, we can reduce that burden. I'm going to go straight to the punch and just say that I don't know that these objectives will be fulfilled with the way that policy is currently written. And I'll talk about why. Um, I do see some substantial policy issues with, with the way that policy is being written today. Um, I, one of my um, uh, colleagues, another grad student at Guelph, um, Andrew Train and, his prof and, and Professor David Snow, wrote an interesting blog piece about policy myopia. And that's um, when there's a greater level of certainty that's assumed in the short term than may exist in the long term, where unintended consequences may result. And I would suggest the fall of rural economies as a potential unintended consequence of, some, of, of this policy if our industry participants can't or don't transition. So policy myopia is a source of policy failure, which is typically characterized as the failure of policy efforts to obtain objectives. And I'm concerned that those objectives might be hard to reach with the way that our policy is currently written. Um, and so I'm going to mention, I'll talk about how some of the policy is really analogous to some of our existing alcohol and tobacco policy. So policy can be broken down into the three levels of government. The federal level has created this overarching policy, which the provincial governments must operate within, and then the local governments have to operate within the provincial policy. So federally, um, the the Canada or Health Canada is responsible for issuing licenses for cultivation and processing. Those are the two big, um, in terms of numbers of licenses being requested or applied for. Um, I put asterisks by them because it indicates that to to issue a license, um, any applicant actually does require local government support for their license, which is a really good thing that um, local governments and the community level has some level of say, um, so that they can tailor, you know, uh, you know, their regulations to what their communities need. Um, <clears throat> and then federal government's also responsible for nursery research and analytical testing. And the provincial governments have been mandated to set up legislation around distribution and retail. Um, and then they've also been able to determine home cultivation and public consumption within the confines of the federal um, legislation. Uh, so, for example, the federal government has said every household can grow up to four plants and then provinces can come back and say, you know, we think it should be fewer than four plants or no plants at all or whatever they think is most appropriate for their province. And same with public consumption, they can res further restrict public consumption requirements. So over the next four slides, I'm going to do a, a province by province comparison for each of distribution, retail, home cultivation and public consumption just to show how it's quite a patchwork of policy across our country and how there's a lot of analogous policy adoption, um, probably because of this tight time frame of October 17th. So most of our provinces and territories, with the exception of PEI, 
have adopted an existing liquor corporation or branch to handle the distribution of cannabis. And that makes sense in a lot of ways to not reinvent the wheel, use an existing structure or organization or branch. But what doesn't make sense is to treat the commodity of cannabis the same way as alcohol. Whereas alcohol gets better with age, cannabis does not. Cannabis has very specific handling and storage requirements. And so with, in British Columbia, they proposed, or not just proposed, but in British Columbia, there will be one provincial warehouse that all cannabis must go through. Um, and that's located in the lower mainland in Richmond. And so it really doesn't make a lot of sense for a fresh product to be shipped down to Richmond and then shipped back out to some other locations. But um, this is the model being put forth. And again, sort of based off of this existing um, alcohol um, structure. Moving on to look at retail province by province comparison, we see about half of our provinces engaging in private retail and about half in public retail. And then we've got two that are hybrid. British Columbia has a hybrid model as well as the Yukon. Um, to the consumer, maybe private versus public isn't as big of a deal, um, maybe in some ways with product variety with time, but to the independent entrepreneur, it, it really does make a big deal whether it's public or private. Um, there's all of these dispensaries across the province that are hoping to find their place within the legalized regime. And um, they can only do so, of course, when there's private model allowed. Um, interestingly, in British Columbia, there's going to be one public retail store um, on October 17th, located in Kamloops to serve our entire population of 4.6 million people, um, compared to PEI that's proposing four stores for their 150,000 people. So in terms of home cultivation, um, there are three provinces who have outright prohibited the cultivation or the growing of plants. Uh, Manitoba, Quebec, and none of it. And I understand that they have um, set this legislation because there's concern for uh, children inadvertently accessing cannabis if it's grown at home. And there's also concern for diversion to the black market. Um, to address that second concern with, with new technologies like blockchain technology, there's actually no reason to, um, to worry about diversion because we can ensure a transparent supply chain using technologies like blockchain technology. But nonetheless, there's three provinces who have said it's not permitted. And the problem I see with this is that I anticipate residents are gonna come forward and say, this is against my constitutional right. I should be allowed to grow this plant that's legal at the federal level. And so I think that there is going to be some problems with this sort of patchwork of policy, and particularly for those provinces that have not permitted it, permitted home growing. And then similarly, public consumption, I'll just again highlight the provinces that are saying no to public consumption. So Saskatoon, Manitoba, Ontario, New Brunswick, Newfoundland, and the Yukon are saying no public consumption. You can only consume cannabis in private spaces, which is not only gross in my mind, but, um, but it really marginalizes the underprivileged people. Um, so there's a legal substance, but we provide no legal means to consume it if you don't own your own house. Um, so I think, again, this is going to pose some problems, um, particularly for the, for the, in the areas that have prohibited public consumption outright. And so I've talked about federal uh, policy, provincial policy, and now just going down to local government policy. Local government has the ability to support or not support both cultivation and retail applicants, which is wonderful. They get to um, decide what's best for their community. The downside to this, to this responsibility is that it costs them time and money and it shoulders a lot of burden. That, that means the local governments are shouldering a lot of, of the burden um, being the last line enacting legislation. They can also, permit or prohibit use of agricultural lands in British Columbia anyway um, for growing cannabis for recreational purposes. Some local governments have said no ag lands for recreational um, cannabis and other local governments have said it's a case by case basis. Uh, local government has been required to modify their zoning bylaws um, and really that means they can either zone in cannabis facilities or zone them out depending on what, um, what the opinion is in the community. 
And then the local, go local government also has the opportunity to um, decide on public consumption rules. So within the province of Alberta, where it, public consumption may be okay with restrictions, um, some local governments like Calgary have said, no public consumption is allowed in our city. Um, and so, and, and then further kind of adding to the burden is there's many rural areas. Um, I, I found, certainly found this when I was talking to elected officials at, at the UBCM, there's many rural areas that don't have any bylaw zoning um, or any business license um, permitting processes to address this emerging market. So they're forced to come up with these processes and, and address all of these, you know, this, these needs at a local government level, which really means they're shouldering a lot of responsibility and costs. So I see this patchwork of policy across our, our country and within provinces. I mean, one person can go from city to city to city and not necessarily know what the rules are. Obviously, it's up to the consumer to find out what the rules are. Um, but if I gave you that, if I threw this question out to the group, considering Richmond, Calgary, and Toronto, three major cities in three different provinces, where out of those three cities can you consume cannabis publicly? Um, I'll tell you the answer, none of them, um, you know, and so while it's, it's going, Ontario has said no public consumption, period, there's a thousand dollar fine if you break that rule, five thousand dollar fine on your second offense, um, Alberta has allowed public consumption, but Calgary has not, and same with BC has allowed public consumption under certain restrictions, but Richmond, ironically, has disallowed any public consumption and any um, cannabis facility, Although what's ironic is that they are the location of the provincial distribution hub and warehouse. So there's a lot of uncertainty with this policy that's being written. I would suggest um, that the black market might even flourish. Uh, people are saying that, that uh, because of the legalization and the requirement to take all these products off of the dispensary shelves, the black market might actually have a niche to fill to supply the medical demand. Um, people have been, been, you know, disobeying the law because they feel it's been against their constitutional right for decades and so I anticipate we'll continue to see some of that particularly in the more restrictive areas and this accompany, accompanying bill B, bill, B, uh, bill C46 um, it's an amendment to the a criminal act to address driving under the influence. There's a lot of anticipated litigation because the way that it's written right now is someone could be convicted for a DUI without committing a crime. And so what I mean is that if you have above this threshold of THC um, detected, it doesn't indicate that you're intoxicated, but it indicates you're above the threshold, which means that you could land a DUI without actually being intoxicated. So I anticipate a bunch of problems with this accompanying bill. And so I'll leave you with this final question um, <clears throat> that was posed to us at one of the info sessions in Nelson not long ago by Murray Rankin, who is an MP from Victoria. Um, what if you create a regulatory regime and, and no one came? Um, I think that, that there is certainly some risk, uh, particularly in some areas, that these rules will, will not necessarily be followed. And, and not because people want to disobey them, but some people will just not know. So there'll be a big challenge in communicating what the rules are from province to province and community to community. So that wraps up my presentation. Thank you so much for uh, listening. I'm looking forward to hearing your comments and your questions. I already got some feedback on um, an error that I had in the slide about uh, Manitoba's distribution authority. So thank you very much. Um, if you want to reach out to me at my Guelph email, please do so. And uh, also feel free to stop at my um, website, which is ruralbclegalizationstudy.wordpress.com. And you can reach out to me that way as well. Thank you, Tracy. Um, for sharing this information with us. It was very informative um, and we really enjoyed it. Thank you. Um, I would ask you that you unshare your screen now. Thank you. Um, so just uh, for those uh, um, in the audience, the Q&A box at the bottom, I would ask you to just input your questions there um, so that they can get asked. I did have one question from Jocelyn Betty. Um, she is asking, um, can Tracy explain the difference between the black market and the gray market? Yeah, thank you. I, I, I actually realized as I was working through this that I should have defined those. Um, so the black market is operating entirely in, within the illegal realm. <laughs> Um, the gray market is, is the space between the illegal and the legal. So the gray market is what's really um, 
developed because of dispensaries and because of these personal use production licenses and these designated use production licenses. So what it is is that people are getting legal licenses to produce cannabis for medical reasons. Um, so they might have a license to grow 30 plants or 100 plants. And so then, you know, they, they produce um, cannabis for this purpose, for these licenses, but any surplus then gets sold off to dispensaries or um, private sales or whatever. And that's the gray market. So it's, you know, they, they're producing under a legal, um, their author they've got the authority to produce legally, um, but they're going outside of the boundaries and, and participating in the illegal market as well. So that's the gray market, whereas the black market is purely within illegal means. So they're producing illegally or participating um, in the market in an illegal way. Okay, I have another question. It's from Lindsay, um, okay. or sorry, Leslie. Would you be able to clarify, and then it says, in Manitoba, public consumption is allowed if the local government allows it. Not quite, no. <laughs> I shouldn't say not quite. The answer is no. Manitoba right now has specified that public consumption is not permitted, that the only consumption of cannabis will be in private residences. So local government technically should be operating within those provincial guidelines. Okay. Otherwise, um, we're breaking the provincial rule, yeah. <laughs> okay, so Ray Bowman has a few questions. Um, his first question is, can the rural areas access the marketing channels? Um, should they all uh, BC producers more in Richmond, BC? Move? Oh, should, can the rural areas access the marketing channels? Should they all, should all BC producers move to Richmond, BC? More? I'm not sure, Ray, if I understand your question. Um... I think marketing uh, marketing is an area that I'm not entirely familiar with because there's such tight constraints over wh what and how um, cannabis can be marketed. Um, so I, I'm afraid I can't answer that question yet. Um, sorry, Ray, and I'm not entirely sure that I knew exactly what you were getting after. I do see you have another question about who can produce at a lower cost, smaller producers or larger producers. Uh, I mean, larger producers have the benefit of economies of scale. Um, you know, when we talk about production costs, um, outdoor production has a lower cost than indoor production for the obvious reasons that you don't have the same electricity requirements for lighting. Um, you don't have the same um, in infrastructure maintenance um, that, a, that a structure, an indoor structure would require compared compared to outdoor. So I, I know that there's a lot of talk about um, efficiencies in outdoor production, um, but then in terms of the quality or the value of, of, of cannabis produced outdoors, I understand it's perceived as being less as what's produced indoors. So I'm not sure if that cost benefit is um, realized in the end with the, with the wholesale price. Okay, um, Anne is asking what was the website address on your last slide? Oh, thank you. Yeah, you can even, I think, put it in the chat box so that they have Yeah, it. I'll do that right now. Thank you. Yeah. Paul Kelly is asking, is there any headway being made with U.S. border services regarding travel to the U.S. for Canadians um, who will be involved in legal cannabis trade? Um, unfortunately, from what I understand, the answer is no. We have not made any headway. Um, so people have probably heard the news has been quite good at sharing this that anyone who participates in the cannabis industry or who invests in the cannabis industry does face potentially being banned from the U.S. for a lifetime. Um, so, yeah, the, it, it, it's not looking positive right now. Okay. Okay, I see Ray's sort of elaborated on this question. Yes, the tight constraints and marketing seems to be the issue. If all cannabis has to go through Richmond, then everyone that is near to Richmond should have an advantage. I, I suppose in terms of shipping costs, yes. Um, because to get their product to the distribution warehouse, it costs less. And then also to receive it from the warehouse would cost less compared to someone who lives further away, like where I live, which is, you know, a nine hour drive from Richmond. Yeah, so it, that's interesting. It sort of favors people that are around that um, provincial warehouse. Okay. Um, I think Kim doesn't have a question, but I think she just has a statement there. Thank you, Kim. Um, just knowing, just letting to um, just stating that new ruling today in Ontario is allowing cannabis smoking everywhere. Uh, tobacco smoking is permitted. 
Okay, thank you. So yeah, and Ontario has changed quite a bit with their change in government. They originally said only public and then they said private retail stores. And so now they're changing their consumption laws as well. And I think we're going to continue to see a lot of changes. Um, you know, we're, things are happening as uh, one of my old professors like to say in this compressed time and space. And so we're going to see changes in laws and legislation around cannabis happen really rapidly. And I think that's going to be a challenge to both um, consumers and participants in the industry to respond to these changes and to know that they've happened. Yeah. Um, I do have one more question. Um, it was from earlier, um, Julie McNice. Um, she was asking, because Southern Manitoba farmers have used chemicals so heavily in the soil, how is it possible for them to transition to growing hemp or cannabis organically suitable for the safe CBD products? That is a question outside of my um, realm of expertise. Um, I mean, I guess that would apply. I, I guess that would apply to any agricultural commodity that's trying that's being grown on uncontaminated soils. I don't know what the answer is, um, but I can sure see how that poses a problem. I'm sorry, I can't answer that. Mm -hmm. Um, and I see this question by Keith. Um, do you see processing only operations being viable under the new licensing structure? And I do. Um, so processing is everything after growing it. So the drying, the packaging, the pressing of oils. And, um, you know, initially um, in three weeks time on October 17th, there's a very limited um, array of products that will be legal. But I think down the road when... Um, you know, the government has committed to addressing, you know, the product availability in the future in one year time. And I think downstream processing will be a big, um, big business at that time. If we look to markets south of the border, it, you know, flour is, is not the most popular product at all. It's all the processed items that, that can be derived from the flour. So I think that a processing application is very viable. Okay. Um, are there any other questions that anyone has that would like to ask? And I can also be reached um, by email or through that website as well. Okay, so I believe these are all our questions. Um, Tracy, do you have anything to add? No, thank you again for your um, your attendance and thank you so much for pointing out that I had an error with my Manitoba Distribution Authority. Um, and I look forward to connecting with you in the future. I'll also be at the SURF conference in Saskatoon if anyone's there and maybe we can connect in person. So thanks everybody and have a great day.